Um, thank you for coming. I'm Marianne Bishop. I'm president of Prince William Sound Audubon Society. Uh, Milo is our vice president, and he is our secretary treasurer. And we're always looking for other people to help on our board. So if you're interested, please just talk to any of us. Um, tonight, uh, actually, Milo and I are giving talks about some uh, two different trips that we took to the Yukon Delta. Uh, before we get to that, there's a couple other uh, announcements I want to uh, quickly make. Um, one of the things that Audubon sometimes does is comment on different uh, issues, and we did send a letter in this week and commented on the proposed Navy war games out in the Gulf of Alaska, which are pretty, they're proposed to be pretty close to Prince William Sound, and there's, I forget, an estimated 38,000 marine mammal takes, which means it could disrupt their behavior and um, the potential impacts are fish are unknown. So we commented uh, encouraging them, well, first of all, to go with the no change, uh, no action alternative, which means they would continue to do their war games like they have in the past, which didn't, uh, are not quite as uh, expansive as the ones they're proposing to do, and uh, to move them so that they're not so close to the sea mounts if they didn't still decide to go forward with this, this more expanded war games, and to, um, do them in the winter time by riders being laid down this round. So we did send our comments in on that this week. Um, the Christmas bird count this year is going to be early. Um, it's going to be so market calendar Sunday, uh, December 10th. And uh, we, the Tuesday before we'll do our annual Rush up on your winter birds uh, presentation that Milo gives. Um, so please mark your calendars for that because it's not the usual third Tuesday of the month when we have our meeting. Uh, yes. I think it's 14th. 14th? Okay, sorry. Okay, the 14th. So it's Sunday, the 14th of December uh, that we'll be having that. And we'll meet um, in the morning at my house. And we'll have good coffee and donuts and assign people their routes. And then um, we'll have a potluck. Um, there are two um, uh, Sunday nights. Well, maps and all that kind of information. I live very close to here, so it's a pretty convenient spot. So, Christmas bird count. Okay, the other thing I wanted to mention briefly, in case you didn't make it Thursday night to the Historical Society uh, meeting, Dick Shellhorn, our local uh, writer, uh, referee, historian, a little bit of everything just published uh, a book called uh, Time and Tide. It's got a lot of history of Cordova. It's quite good. I've read the first two chapters, and I find it quite entertaining. It's for sale at the um, Historical uh, Society at the, at the museum there. And so I urge you all to uh, pick up a copy. OK, as soon as Milo gets here, we'll put the slides up. But in, oh, but before we start, so birds, does anybody have any interesting bird sightings they want to mention? Or? Has anybody seen anything unusual? Dave, I'll start with you. No, no, I've been bit the dark most of the time. Uh -huh. And has anybody been out Probably. around? And I, I haven't been by the lake to notice if at the waterfall this time of year there's usually a big flock of scop. Are they there, Carl? Yeah, yeah, there were, yeah, I think there were about 50 of them, middle. Oh, well, just 50, because lots of times there's a like couple hundred. Yeah, I saw several hundred uh, yes. about a week ago. Oh, okay. So they're there. And, and sometimes in that flock there's a tuft of duck. You know, in past years when Aaron uh, Lang was here, he could have a scope and would find that one tuck of duck. Yeah. Um, so, Milo, did you have any bird sightings, or does anybody else have any bird sightings? Mm -hmm. well, I, I saw an old squad down Al Yannick by itself, a uh hen -huh, cruising around. An early arrival? Yeah. Yeah. It was pretty cool. It was last Monday. Yeah, they should be coming in soon. Good. There's a great horned owl hanging out around 10 miles with a bum right eye. Oh, really? Uh, we were told for Kings a week ago Monday and saw ancient Maryland's over by Sheep Point. Uh, oh, that's very yeah. exciting, yeah. And, uh, yeah. Well, this ago, we packed far enough a couple of weeks ago to the Bonaparte Park called in uh, Simpsons. Mm -hmm. they, uh, seems to be a pretty regular fall. Oh, okay, so they're stopping. I think so, I don't know where they're going. Okay. There's a solar eclipse tomorrow. Sorry? A solar eclipse tomorrow. Oh, okay. What time is that at? That starts about noon or so. I think it's around 1.30 or 1.45. About 3, 
I think it's better than three quarter of coverage, but it's gonna get it's sunny tomorrow, it'll get dim. Okay, so just just warn you don't look directly at the sun. Yeah. So. Uh, Gerald, have you seen any interesting birds? Or? No. No? <laughs> <laughs> I've been in Anchorage. Nothing interesting. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, then uh, I did the Christmas bird thing, kind of announcing it. Do you have any other announcements that you can do right now? Put the Christmas bird count on your calendars. Uh, you know, it's the opening of the count window, the Sunday, the 14th. So, so start, start planning on it. We'd love to have you. Okay, so I'm going to go first, and I'm going to uh, talk about a project I've been doing on black turnstones uh, with uh, Christine Sal from the Yukon Delta National Wildlife Refuge and Audrey Taylor from University of Alaska and Anchorage. any of these photos. Um, Christine Sal from Yukon Delta and Jessica Stocking who just left the Science Center to go back to grad school. They are two photographers of, uh, that I used uh, for this presentation. And this is a spectacle eye repair. Oh, sorry. That worked. Whatever you did. No, yeah. it's, it's oh, a okay. uh, yeah, so mild yeah. flexible. So, yeah. so yeah. if you press the bottom of this, uh -huh. it advances. Mm -hmm. And the top of this. Okay. Okay, so my thanks to the two photographers. Um, our species of interest is the black turnstone. Um, it's an interesting bird uh, because it's a rocky shoreline bird, which means it's hard to study. And uh, it breeds on the blue part of that map in western Alaska. It winters from Kodiak down uh, through Mexico. Yeah. I believe it's been declining and it has a population of under 100,000 birds. Um, why, what is the connection to Prince William Sound? You're probably wondering, what is someone from the Science Center doing studying black turnstones out of the Yukon Delta? Well, in 1989, when the Exxon Valdez oil spill happened, um, they got a call from some fishermen who were helping with the spill that they were seeing thousands and thousands of shorebirds at Montague Island, and it turned out they were black turnstones and surf birds. And this was the first time they'd ever found a, a stopover like this with thousands of birds, and they were feeding on herring spawn. So I uh, did some subsequent work there in the mid-90s, 94 to 97, at Montague Island, looking at um, 
the turnstones and circuits. And we did some, um, when I looked at the data, just took our peak counts, peak one day counts, and that was typically around May 3rd, right in there, the 3rd through the 5th. Uh, we saw these kinds of numbers of turnstones, anywhere from 11,000 birds in uh, 93 and 97, so some pretty high numbers. So the herring have shifted in Prince William Sound and are now up uh, more around Port Gravina, and there's been very little spawn around Montague Island now for several years. So I went back in uh, 2010, and we did a series of surveys, and we were out 19 consecutive days. Well, actually, there was one day with the rain. We, we couldn't make it out. We went out of the rock the day. And total for those 19 days, and this was covering a 50-kilometer stretch every one of those days, the total, some total for all those days was only 3,500 birds. So very, very reduced numbers using uh, Montague Island. So that brought up the question, okay, what's... What's happening? Have the migration routes changed, or is the black turnstone population declining? And all many, many shorebird species are declining, so that's been one of our concerns. Climate change uh, could potentially be impacting the black turnstone. Uh, erosion uh, tied in with climate change, flooding in the breeding grounds, just a lot of different things. So um, those are the two questions we wanted to look at. And the one place where we could really start to answer those questions were the breeding grounds. So we decided to go to part of the breeding grounds, which is the Yukon Cuscoquan Delta, uh, which is highlighted in kind of cranberry color on this map. And specifically, uh, we went to an area uh, called Tataco. And uh, Tataco is uh, here, it's that red star on the map. Uh, this is a Landstat picture from uh, just earlier this month, October 1st. Um, as you can notice, one thing about the Delta is there's water everywhere. You know, I've flown the Copper River Delta a lot, and I'm always in awe. And then I went to the Yukon Delta, and I thought, we're like a postage stamp compared to the Yukon Delta. It's so incredible. There's just water, ponds everywhere. It's the most amazing wetland I've ever seen. And so uh, where we went was on this Tataco River. Um, and Milo, I'm going to have you point out where your camp was so people get an idea. Yeah, when I give the talk about the trip that Paula and I took, uh, we were dropped off right here. So, you know, it's a crow flies, you know, probably less than 10 miles away. shot of the area. Very flat, very low. You know, there's an, I don't think any elevation over 100 feet there. Yeah. Uh, this was our study site on the Tataco. The reason we went to the Tataco is because there was a study done there in the late 70s by a woman named uh, Colleen Handel, who was with USGS. She did her PhD research here. And so we went back to her original two study sites uh, to do, to look at the breeding densities there. So to do our work, uh, we had to fly from Bethel to Chivac, uh, which is a, um, a native community. This looks like just kind of putting the boat in, but you sink in the mud about 10 inches every time you move your foot. So it's much more painful than it looks here. Um, we had five people going in our crew, so we had about three weeks worth of spots and um, tents and all that. Uh, not much room, there was room for the driver and one passenger, and then the other boat uh, had uh, the rest of the crew. It was about a two and a half hour boat trip to get there, and we had to go out into the Bering Sea, down the Kashinik River, uh, out to the, into the Bering Sea, back up the Chitago River. This is the field camp we were at. Um, this field camp has actually been in existence for 30 years. And uh, but they take it down every uh, fall, and when we were there, there were actually 16 of us uh, there. So it's quite an extensive camp. Um, 16 is a lot of people. So you have your scenic outhouses. One way looks out of the ponds. The other way looks across the river. <laughs> so one of the camps is dedicated to looking at the Brant colony. This has the largest 
Grant County in the world. Uh, that's the camp that's been there for 30 years. A guy named Jim Settinger, he used to be at University of Alaska Fairbanks. He's now at University of Nevada in Reno. Uh, this has been his baby. He's had multiple, multiple grad students doing their work there. And there are geese everywhere. Uh, these are some of the sleep tents you're looking at. Ours are the little ones. The darker ones are some of the folks that worked on the grant project. Uh, the other project uh, is brand new. It's uh, by a guy named Jeff Welker, who's at the University of Alaska Anchorage, and uh, uh, a professor from University of Utah, or Utah State University, whose name I'm forgetting. And that's looking at climate change and the impact of geese grazing on the grass. And so these were some growth chambers they were doing uh, with sedges. And then we were the third camp uh, studying the black turnstone. So one of the reasons uh, we went to the breeding grounds was to look at the densities of the birds that were nesting, but also to be able to catch the birds to put on geolocators, because the geolocators we could use as a tool to tell us where the birds were migrating. And the way these work are, uh, they have a little light sensor on them, and then you catch the bird, you put this on it, and then you get to go back a year later and catch them again, take that light sensor off, download the data, and interpret it, and it tells you sort of, you can help estimate the lat and long from it, and then see the progression of where the bird stays over time. So this is a, a relatively um, new technology that's been used now for several different species. It's inexpensive, you can get these for under 200 bucks a piece, and um, they're very lightweight, they weigh, weigh like about a gram, so you can put them on small birds. Whereas, you know, if we were dealing with a big bird, we could put a satellite transmitter on it when we'd never have to recatch the bird. But with these, you do have to recatch the bird, which is painful and time consuming. So, uh, as I mentioned earlier, our other question was, besides you know, as migration route changes, the population declining, so we wanted to compare the nesting results from the 70, also look at some of the habitat changes going on. And this is what the habitat looks like. Looks pretty plain here, like, oh, well, not much happening. But everywhere you look is birds. It's like the Serengeti birds. I mean, just in this one picture, you've got an Arctic tern dive bombing the tundra swans. You've got a mugo towards the front. You've got a Sabine gull behind the swan there on the right. You've got a, a uh, brag goose in the background there. And that's typical. What time of year was this? This was May, uh, the last two weeks of May that I was out there. Um, as I mentioned, it's got the world's largest grant colony. They always had to be careful. They were constantly getting up off their nests. You know, they try to hide from me, but you get too close to get up. Sometimes they try to defend, like this one was. And I tell you, I wouldn't have minded hatching out of a nest like that. They have a beautiful little nest, and I think Milo brought a piece of a nest. Paul, <laughs> Paul brought a piece of a nest. And of course, whenever you're looking for nests of uh, black turnstones, you're constantly being dive bombed by mugles or else Sabine gulls. And this is what we were looking for, the black turnstones, they're out, found in these uh, sedges. And so you kind of wait, watch them, wait, wait for them to go to their nests or else you walk quickly and hope you flush one to find their nest. And when you find their nest, typically they they hide them right under a little bit of, a little clump of grass. And so these are all examples of black turnstone nests. There's some more examples. The one on the left is a little more, a little easier to find. They're, they're, they take a while, they really do. And there's a very, you know, variation in color. Some are light brown, some are as green as can be like this. Mm -hmm. So, oops. So when you find a nest, you know, we measured it, measured the eggs, okay, how is this nest? You know, get an idea, you know, is it safe to try to trap the bird now? Because if you trap the bird that's sitting on the nest too early, they'll abandon the nest. So they can do all those kinds of things. So you find the nest, then you set a trap, and then you wait. Literally, you lie down flat and you wait, and you wait for the bird to come back to its nest. And then you catch it with this bow net. You pull a string, you've got this long, long string coming from the net, and you've got this net really tight, and then it flips over and catches the bird. And then you've got your bird that you're ready to ban. And the green flag, 
in case you ever see a bird with a green flag, that means it was banded in the United States. And so we used either alphanumeric, either a number and, and a letter, or else just we ran out of some of those bands the first year, so we went to just color bands too, to individually identify all the birds. Took a lot of measurements, you know, on the bill, on the leg, looked at the wings for the molt, and then attached with a little backpack, a little kind of a, a little harness effect, basically. Uh, this was actually uh, put the light sensors on then. So last year, uh, the first year, we caught, they found 72 nests and they banded 80 turnstones and put out 30 with geolocators. So when I went back in 2014, the five of us, our goal was to retrieve as many of those geolocators as possible. You can see this is kind of the areas, some of the areas you find the birds out on the tidal flats. Those are black turnstones there. You have to go across to all, this is uh, going across to this uh, study area across the river, dealing with the mud constantly, and then finding the birds. And um, this is Hotel <coughs> Godwit uh, next to this black turnstone. So looks easy, but it's not to see those bands. So here they are wandering around in these sedges, and you're trying to see these color bands so you know, okay, do I need to catch that bird? Does that bird have a geolocator? Sometimes they sit on top of your cook tent, you know you want to catch them, or they're sitting on top of observation towers, or sometimes they're much nice, easy to see, easy to see their numbers, but then you've got to find their nest. But um, we prevailed, or I should say Jessica and, and Christine and Audrey prevailed, they were great at finding these birds. Uh, 18 of the 30 geolocators have been retrieved. Uh, and the data from that is now being analyzed. Uh, they, 90 nests were located this year. And so to bring all this back to Prince William Sound, and this coming spring, based on that geolocator data, we'll be able to see where we can estimate where they're stopping in Prince William Sound. That is, if they still are stopping in Prince William Sound, and we'll be going out and try to find those uh, spots to identify where they are stopping over now. So just to acknowledge my collaborators, uh, Dr. Audrey Taylor and Christine, and then our various funders here. So with that, I'll turn things over to Milo, and we'll take questions at the end, OK? Thank Mine's going to be just a bunch of pretty pictures of the bird life in the area from a trip that Paula and I took you know, about the first week of June. And it was complete coincidence that Marianne and I made our first trips there in the same spring. Uh, but it had been on both our life lists for, for quite a while. And the way it got put on my radar was uh, a friend of mine, Tim Bowman, who's a, a sea duck biologist for the Fish and Wildlife Service in Anchorage for years has been showing me pictures of when he goes out to the YK Delta doing these annual uh, um, bird surveys, which uh, Melissa Gabrielson has done for years. Uh, she, it, who, who now works for, the, for us, for the Forest Service, worked for the Yukon Kuskokwim, or the Yukon Delta National Wildlife Refuge uh, for years, and she's been involved in those same camps. But anyway, these pictures that, and, and the stories that Tim Bowman told me were like everywhere you walk, there's a nest. You know, the, the western sandpipers and dunlins that migrate through here all go there to breed, plus the waterfowl, the, the, you know, the geese especially, and uh, that it was just rich. And for photography, it, you know, it's a dream come true because everywhere you look, there's a bird displaying or a bird on a nest. And so I've wanted to get there, but it's a busy time of year, you know, with field work here. It's not cheap to get there. You know, you could volunteer for the Fish and Wildlife Service, but I do photography part-time professionally. And if you work for the Fish and Wildlife Service, you can't shoot and own your own pictures or try to sell your own pictures. So uh, I did a little bit of research, and it wasn't that cheap. But uh, I said, heck, you know, I can't put this off forever. So Paula and I flew to Bethel with Airline Miles. 
We found an uh, air service, the same one that the Fish and Wildlife Service uses, called Ptarmigan Air, and uh, hired a beaver to fly us um, from Bethel to uh, uh, Hazen Bay, which is where we made our camp. So here's Bethel, and then uh, here's where we got dropped off. It's about 112 miles as the, as the crow flies, and it was about, a, about an hour flight, I think. Uh, across that, that region of the state. And uh, here's a picture that shows, uh, I didn't want that. I think this, yeah, it has a laser pointer. Uh, this shows the Yukon Kuskokwim Delta proper. Here's where the Yukon River comes into the Bering Sea. Here's where the Kuskokwim River comes down into the Bering Sea. Uh, Bethel lies about right here. And so we flew from there out to Hazen Bay, which is right here. Marianne's camp was somewhere uh, up in here, I think. And uh, Chivak uh, up here is 35 miles away. There's a little tundra, or there's a little village here that was about 18 miles for, from where we were. Uh, or no, it might be down here. Uh, but anyway, Tim Bowman, you know, picked handpicked a place on the map where he he's done plots uh, just as Melissa has all over this area, and he says. Right here, you will have phenomenal densities and diversity of birds. And I said, good enough, that, that's what I'm looking for. And a couple things that were high on my list were spectacle eiders, which I'll show you pictures of, which is a duck that'll just blow your mind, you know, just really neat coloration. Emperor geese, it's where, you know, basically the whole world's population of emperor geese uh, uh, nest. And, you know, some of these are birds that birders in the lower 48 would give their eye teeth uh, to see. And uh, anyway, they're, they're everywhere you look out here. So I was really excited. And so was Paula. You know, she was up, she's up for any adventure. And also, uh, you know, it's just background for art that she likes to do. So uh, that's what we planned. And uh, I was going to show you the refuge here. And we've got a big national wildlife refuge. This is the Yukon Delta National Wildlife Refuge. You know, here's where we are over here in Cordova. The Kenai Refuge is a pretty big refuge. And uh, Melissa was telling me, I guess there's a little rivalry between the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, you know, Anwar, and the Yukon Delta, for which is actually bigger, but they're both huge chunks of land and, uh, you know, just vast. So here uh, is a selfie with Paula's iPad. So you're going to see a mix of Paula's iPad pictures uh, and then uh, my pictures mixed in, you know, to tell the story. Uh, anyway, we flew to Bethel. Here we are there. And then we uh, got together with Ptarmigan Air and took a beaver uh, out to the coast, 100 miles. And I wanted to point out these villages, and I, I had to write down the names. Uh, they're refer referred to casually as the Tundra Villages. There are two native villages that are close to each other, Kasigluk and Nunapichuk. And Nunapichuk. I know, Nunapichuk. Nunapichuk. All right. I have no idea how close I was to pronouncing those. Uh, and what fascinated Paula and I was what are these villages doing here? They're, you know, to our eye and my limited knowledge of the area, no resources right at those villages. They're not on a salmon stream. There's no caribou right there. The moose density would be very low. I mean, they probably can pass through there, but there's no timber and not a lot of willow there. Uh, there po probably are pike and, and uh, whitefish in, the, in that stream there, and they can access other areas. They have motor boats and they can go out to the Kuskokwim River and, uh, and snow machines to get to forested areas where caribou migrate. But anyway, it was just really interesting to see these villages really in the middle of nowhere. You know, I guess by, uh, as the crow flies, they're 25 miles from Bethel, but why were they located in an area that seems to have very few resources? And uh, uh, Caligula, or, is that right? Uh, it, it's Kasiglik is being relocated because it's getting flood, flooded. Uh, the water is rising and it's being relocated right here. So uh, they have troubles with uh, rising water. But anyway, very interesting villages if you need to learn more about them. And then as our beaver got closer to the coast, we started seeing the landscape that we were going to be spending a week in, uh, five days I think. And uh, here is uh, Hazen Bay out here. And uh, I forgot the name of this river, our camp. We're going to get landed and dropped off right here uh, on this corner of these two sloughs here. And uh, anyway, it's like Swiss cheese with ponds. Uh, they are everywhere. 
And uh, oh, there's a, also a really interesting fact. Uh, I think the previous slide, one of these previous slides would be the best. OK, so we're flying. And uh, we're getting close to where we're going to be. Our camp's you know, right, right in here somewhere. About five miles away, uh, our pilot points out the high tide line. He says, oh, see all this driftwood right here? That's where storms push uh, all the you know, driftwood uh, you know, in, in, whenever you get big storms. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, I'll, I'll, get, I'll, I'll come back to that fact in, in, in a minute. But anyway, it was interesting that we were flying well beyond the, the high tide line out, out to the coast. So again, here, here's what it looks like, just flat as a pancake, but water, you know, ponds everywhere. And I guess they're brackish because of the salt water overflow. Uh, it wasn't fresh water. And uh, things are barely greening up when we were there. Uh, I'll show you some, some more looks at that. There's tidal sloughs that bisect the landscape, and they can be problematic. Uh, we were loaned a pack raft, but never had to use it. We just uh, confined ourselves to what we could access on foot. And unlike the Copper River Delta, which is all bog and you need chest waders to walk anywhere out here. Uh, this is all relatively hard ground and you can get by with extra tufts and that was kind of handy. And so we would walk miles each day, uh, you know, in different directions, uh, you know, looking for uh, different nests or species that uh, we wanted to see or photograph. And then the only obstacles were these tidal sloughs or uh, maybe a slough like this. And at high tide they were a barrier uh, and at low tide you could, you could get through them. Uh, anyway, we just learned you know, the country we could access, and we had plenty to access uh, you know, just you know, without a boat. Or, and, and I wore chest waders a fair amount of the time. So here's our camp uh, where uh, uh, we got dropped off right here. And so basically this slough was one of our boundaries. This was a boundary. Uh, we came out here to the coast. You know, that was a boundary. And then we probably wandered about as far as this tidal slough, a couple miles. Interesting that from camp, the only feature on the landscape that we could see was a, the hill or the mountain. Uh, and we thought, oh, it'd be fun to walk over there one day. Well, it was about a mile and a half or two miles away. The, the ground rose about seven or eight feet. You know, that, that was the high country for there. And, uh, you know, that was your monumental view of, of the area. So here we are getting dropped off with the beaver. This is the pilot from Ptarmigan Air in Bethel. And uh, this is... You know, some pretty sloppy going, but this was really only, the, the only really nasty stuff was the tidal sloughs. And we got dropped off at low tide. Uh, Tim Bowman got dropped off at, uh, at a camp earlier, and he knew that high tide's the preferable time to get dropped off. So uh, they had to come back to Bethel to get us, and then they came, by the time that we got dropped off, it was much lower. Paula got out of the plane trying to carry some gear up this mucky slope here. It was slippery, it was deep. And uh, she started falling over with the gear, so I helped her. Pull my shoe off right away. Pull my shoe off, yeah. <laughs> so I said, you just sit. And then I ran back and forth a uh, little bit the gear. But you can see that, that the monkey tracks there. And then the airplane left us uh, with our camping gear for five days and, you know, 100 miles from Bethel and, you know, a pretty bleak landscape. Yeah. But uh, it was also pretty exciting at the same time. But as soon as we got dropped off, I started looking at the ground and the you know the flat mud in between the ponds and stuff. I go, Paula, I'm not sure we're above high tide. <laughs> it, it was a little alarming, and we knew where this driftwood line is. And uh, anyway, we were just barely above high tide. Uh, our tent didn't get flooded or anything, but had a low pressure system come, uh, or which is more likely to happen in the fall. Uh, we'd have been in serious trouble. And Nils Warnock, who works, uh, he's the exec executive director for uh, Audubon, Alaska. Um, he's been to some of the camps, maybe the one that uh, Mary Ann was, was at. Uh, they lost their whole camp, tens of thousands of dollars worth of gear in a fall storm like that. You've probably heard these stories. Yeah, they have pictures of it. The yeah. weather ports actually uplifted and floated out into the ocean. Yeah, yeah. And they had to retrieve them. Yeah. So, had a freak storm like that come along, we, we were toast or we, we'd be needing help uh, real fast. Uh, so it's a really hostile environment and uh, you know, impressive in that, that sense too. So there's our camp, our tent we set up. You know, looking at how flat the landscape is. There it looks like a couple of maybe tackling geese in the foreground there. There's us sitting in camp. 
can't see the hill in this picture. Another camp shot. And I brought a laptop with uh, uh, digital photography. You're kind of confined to needing battery power and electronics. This laptop has pretty decent battery life. And uh, for the five days, I was certain it had enough battery life to download the images and back them up on another hard drive. So uh, each uh, midday or evening, I would back up pictures. And we brought our lawn chairs and had a little foam stove. But we were a little light on water. We, we kind of thought the flying service would have big jugs, and they didn't. So we had to buy a few of these. But uh, we ended up having enough, I think, just for those three. Uh, anyway, we were self-contained. Another view of camp. I stuck in here uh, just to show how early in the spring it was. Here it is, first week of June, and the very first green sprouts are, are showing up. Um, the tiniest bit of color every once in a while. Um, Greenland primrose, could that be right? Uh, I, I looked that up after I got back. This was the only uh, flower that, that we saw, and it was sparse. We only saw it in a few locations. There's a close up there. And uh, you know, we just went for walks, and, and we started finding stuff everywhere we walked. Uh, this is the day we walked out to the coast, about two miles away. So here we are on Hazen Bay, you know, the, the edge of the Bering Sea. There's Paula with the Bering Sea and Hazen Bay behind her. And then everywhere you went, there were you know, evidence of birds and, and actual birds. This is a mud flat, uh, you know, on, on the tundra or the, or the you know, wetland. Uh, just covered with shorebird tracks. Here you can see sh shorebird tracks and, and a duck walking by. Um, and this isn't like our shorebird migration where millions of birds come through. This is nesting densities. This, this is, you know, birds just are there dispersed uh, nesting on the landscape, not necessarily flocks of tens of thousands like we get here. But, you know, you can see how these birds cover the landscape. And uh, this is what I was there to do is here's an emperor goose on a nest, and, and here I am uh, laying as flat as I can, uh, trying to get a photograph, you know, sneak. The birds were very cooperative. But literally, everywhere you walked, you found a nest. And that started from when we uh, first got off the airplane. There were Dunlins chatter, chattering at us. You know, we knew we were close to a nest, but some of these nests were kind of hard to find. Dunlins and black turnstones and semi palmated sandpipers were very inconspicuous, and if you were doing a research effort like Mary Ann and, and put in the energy, you could find them, but just casually walking through the landscape, they were, they were difficult to find. But anyway, uh, uh, Paula found a few Dunlin nests, actually. Um, here's a Dunlin. Right where we set up our tent, uh, we had a, a black turnstone ch uh, chattering at us, and uh, we had to move our tent to get it a little bit further from where we thought the nest was. You know, you couldn't be on the delta without being near the nest of something. And then one of my favorite subjects of the trip was a Sabine skull, which had a nest about 50 yards from our uh, tent. And I set up a remote camera to get this picture because it wouldn't let us anywhere near the nest. But uh, my camera on a tripod with a re remote release, I was able to get a shot like this. And then my target for the trip was spectacle eiders. We had a hen on a nest about 50 yards from our tent. And then. Geese are probably the dominant and most visible uh, nesting birds in the area. And there were four species. There were cackling geese, emperor geese, white-fronted geese, and brant. Uh, and their nests were everywhere. And there would always be a goose taking off, you know, leaving you know, the downy nest with eggs uh, in it at your feet, which we would cover, cover over and try to get out of the area. Uh, that's the spectacular emperor goose. Um, you always had a semi-palmated sandpiper uh, chattering you know, because you were near its nest. I don't know that we had, maybe we found one of their nests, uh, but we weren't looking that hard. And here's another black turnstone. If there was one disappointment to the trip, you know, I was expecting to see all our western sandpipers. I saw none. I think I heard some calling, 
Um, but they apparently like a little bit more upland habitat, maybe like where that driftwood starts or something a few miles inland. But uh, we only possibly heard a few westerns. Um, but instead, we had the semi palmated sandpipers in, in Dunlins. Here's some black turnstones. Here's the black turnstone display. Dunlin with a shadow a lot longer than it is tall. And these are the exact same Dunlins that migrate through the Copper River Delta in the spring. There's that cackling goose. There's a cackling goose nest on a pond, typical of what you'd be flushing and seeing, you know, everywhere you look. There's two cackling geese. And then there were birds in the air flying by all the time, you know, birds on the ground. Uh, and you know, for a birder who, who would give anything to see a single uh, emperor goose in their life, you know, here's a flock of you know, probably 20 or 30 emperor geese flying by. I think there's a brant here and a brant here. Otherwise, these are all emperor geese. Our flight, gorgeous goose. Where do they winter, the emperors? Um, I've seen them in Kodiak and in the Aleutians. So that's about as far you know, south as they get. So they're basically an Alaska endemic. You know, they're hard to see outside of Alaska. Yeah. A lot of people would take it off with Photoshop, but I leave it. There's a close-up of the uh, scapulars. Uh, just beautiful goose. There's one in flight. Yeah, it has to be about the prettiest goose in North America anyway. And then other birds that we saw, you know, in passing in various densities were uh, redneck phalaropes. We saw a few red phalaropes, but very, very uh, I didn't get any photographs of those. And I don't have a photo of a white-fronted goose from this trip. Uh, they were a little more, they either laid flat or busted out of their nest and there was no in-between. Uh, some of these other ones would hold tight and let you get pictures of them on the nest, but the white ferns were a little tougher that way. These Sabine's gulls were gorgeous. Uh, it's a gull that I've actually seen in Prince William Sound a few times, but they mostly nest in the Arctic and western Alaska. But uh, they were very common and uh, just beautiful, I thought. And we were at the beginning of the nesting season, but some birds had established nests early enough that they were starting to hatch. This is the first chick we saw, and then we saw a couple of goslings. And I think we were there, I think we left around the 5th or 6th of June. Does that sound right? i got to double check the dates. But uh, anyway, we only saw the very first things hatch. What kind of bird is that? This is a Sabine's gull. Mm -hmm. And there's its agitated uh, parent right there, diving us, diving at us. Uh, glaucus gulls, you know, in contrast to the glaucus wing gulls that are so common here, glaucus gulls uh, were the main gull that was nesting there. Same with, uh, and, and new gulls as well. And then there were a few birds that I would have liked more opportunities at. This is a common eider, hen on a nest. Just a bizarre shaped head uh, on these birds. And uh, we only found about four or five nests of common eiders. And uh, the male, I really had a hard time getting close enough to to photograph. Here's one I snuck up to, and you can see another one that I, I couldn't quite uh, clear the grass before the first one flushed. Uh, this one I snuck up to, and then laying on the edge of a pond, this is the, as close as a male would get to me. But uh, the eiders are spectacular ducks, and the common eider is, is gorgeous. And then uh, I've only seen a single bar-tailed godwit here in Cordova, and it was a female, uh, which are brown like this. And uh, it was awesome to get to see several and, and get to photograph both, including the males. These are the long-distance migrant champions. They're the ones that just a few years back, uh, <coughs> research that Niels Warnock uh, was, was involved in, put geolocators on some uh, uh, bar-tailed godwits and documented their nonstop flights from Alaska to Kamchatka to the Yellow Sea, do I have this right? And then over to Australia or New Zealand. Yeah, and, and those were you know, non-stop segments. We saw bar-tailed godwits in Australia near the Great Barrier Reef in the Whitsunday Islands uh, this past winter. Maybe these same two birds, you, you never know. But uh, pretty incredible to see them in such different settings. I, when I was sitting here before the meeting, I was thinking, dang it, I should have thrown in one of those Australia pictures of a bar-tailed godwit, but I forgot to do that. They're a 
about the, for a shorebird, they're kind of large, uh, maybe a foot tall or something like that. So they dwarf, you know, the sandpipers. Uh, maybe like the wimbrels. I don't know if you know those that we get here. Here's one in flight, a male. And then here's the uh, brant uh, laying flat on a nest. They were uh, somewhat colonial, or, or they were colonial, and uh, so you get into big groups of these. Uh, but they were a little bit difficult to approach on a nest like this. And here is a nest, and Paula brought uh, a little bit of down from a nest that had blown away. Uh, they made a real thick mat out of their feathers, and I think you'll see that uh, if you want to come up and look afterwards. And they were always flying by. And sometimes, you know, you'd be walking around, and these things would see you, you know, sticking out on the landscape, and they'd fly by just to check you out. You know, there were quite a few spectacled eiders, but the chance of one going by you, uh, you know, was probably pretty low. But you'd see them flying away, and then make these big turns, and then fly by you just 20 meters away, or, or make a, a U-turn around you just to check you out sometimes. So it was kind of neat to see that. I don't probably see too many humans out there. And this is one of the birds, even though I'd seen it before and photographed it in Barrow, uh, still it just blows me away, the, the bizarre uh, plumage of the male uh, spectacled eider. And we saw a single Stellar's eider, which is, I guess, quite rare on the, um, the Yukon Custoquim Delta. And there's even a plan to reintroduce them to the area. But here's a group of what, five spectacled eiders and, and you know, the lone Stellar's eider that we saw on the trip. And I just had a ball. They were difficult to get close to, but we found two individual males that were tied by a rope, it seemed like, to the females. You know, just their period of nesting. They must have been still mating and in the process of egg laying or something. And so they would not leave the females. So there were two different indi individual males that I was able to, you know, wait on the edge of a pond and have come quite close. Uh, here's one here. Here's the female. He was tied on a rope too, it seemed like. And they provided some awesome photo opportunities. This, and even the female has the hint of the spectacle, spectacles that the male has. Just a great looking duck. And here's one on just one of those random flybys, you know, coming by to check, check me out. And here's the female. You can see that hint of the spectacle on her face, and they have blue eyes. I thought that was fascinating. And the male does too, but it's a little harder to see against that white background. There's the landscape. Can you guys see the spectacle lighter on the nest? Right in the foreground there. There she is, just uh, laying tight and hoping we don't see her. Do they do they keep their head down most of the time, or All only the time. when they know you're? Oh. oh. Well, they know they they put their heads down before you're yeah. ever they're ever on your radar. Uh, they see you coming a long way off, and yeah, uh, they they lay low whenever you're aware of them. What kind of predators are there? Um, we we did not see any mammals out there, but we saw tracks of fox. Uh, so there's Arctic fox, pretty low densities, because where are they gonna? I mean, this is one thought. One thought I have, Melissa, is that where are they going to den when this whole place gets washed over uh, every winter or fall? Uh, maybe some of those raised areas, like we saw, you know, could be denning habitat. Um, so there's a lot of food, but probably a difficult place to make a living year round. And um, oh, raptors. Uh, yeah, I didn't see any ravens, and the gulls would prey on eggs. Uh, and we saw moose tracks. Uh, we didn't see any yeah. moose, but there's a very small number of, of moose. Maybe it's growing? The it's growing, and they had a couple this year out on the coast, which is highly unusual. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, anyway, we saw probably some very fresh tracks, but we couldn't see the moose anymore. So early on in the trip, we found the, this one uh, pair of spectacle eiders that, that let me get quite close. And I think it was just the stage of mating or incubation that they were in that caused the male to be very, you know, tightly bonded to the female, and the female was on a nest and he just would not leave. And so it was an awesome photo opportunity. So this pond became ground zero, you know, towards the beginning of the first couple days of the trip. It, the days started out sunny the first couple days of our trip, then we had a sunny, windy day, then we had a cloudy, cold, windy day. In fact, it was almost snowing on us on, on the last day that we were there. But I spent quite a bit of time on this pond where these birds were. Here I am uh, laying on, 
on the ground right here, and here's two of the uh, spectacle, spectacle, spectacle lighters swimming in front of me. Here's the female and the male right behind. This amazing duck. Here's the female on the nest, the blue eye. So this pond here was, was paradise, and, and with that gorgeous late uh, summer sunlight, uh, you know, I just laid on the tundra, you know, photographing them whenever they come close. And this turned out to be one of the neatest moments. It was actually a couple different evenings in that beautiful light that I spent there. So I, I, I found this pond because it had a a real cooperative pair of spectacle lighters on it. And so I set up, just laid flat. I didn't use a blind or anything, just laid flat on the ed edge of the pond. And what I got to photograph just laying on the edge of that one pond was just amazing. So within the course of an hour or a couple hours, I had uh, spectacle lighters, you know, like that's not good enough. About 15 feet to my right, I had an uh, Arctic tern on the nest. And it would land on this little island. On that same island, a black turnstone uh, came, you know, a little display uh, going on here. To my left, I had a Dunlin. Uh, it probably has a nest. It's calling here. And then, this long-distance migrant of the, you know, champion of the world, uh, a bar-tailed godwit female, uh, comes towards the edge of the pond. I got a photograph. And then com comes the male. I got to photograph it from the same spot. And then, well, there was an emperor goose nest uh, on the edge of the pond that was near the stellar, the spectacle eider nest. But then, while I'm laying on the pond, uh, or laying on the bank, this uh, emperor goose comes flying in. So I put my camera on it, and I've got a few frames of it coming in for a landing with its feet down like this, in gorgeous light. And it lands on the pond, and it sees my shape, just a lump on, on the edge of the pond uh, in front of it. And so then it just starts swimming up to me. And, and Again, from a photography point of view, it just doesn't get any better than having all these things around you. You don't even know which way to point the camera. <laughs> and uh, anyway, that was the photo highlight of the trip, uh, getting to, to see all that in close proximity. Here's Paula. She was patient. She'd oftentimes get her sketchbook out uh, while I would be laying on the edge of a pond or making a stalk on something. Uh, I think this is when the wind started blowing. Mm -hmm. We called that magic pond, and I just, I'd sit behind and far enough away that nothing would see me, but I saw, when I, I guess it was when the godwits came in, um, I was just like, oh. I almost be loving this. I yeah. see all these birds going. And that's how you found the Dunlin nest. Uh, you were able to just sit quietly yeah. in the Dunlin nest. Uh, I saw the Dunlin chirping all around me, and I thought yeah. was, he wants to be right where I am. I thought there's a nest right near me, and sure enough, he went, just kind of finally disappeared. It looked like a right here. And here I am photographing a black turnstone nest. Oops. This is the one that was right by our, our tent, right by camp. And uh, when the wind came, it, it, we had basically snow falling on us. Uh, it was cold sitting in camp, and here we moved the chairs to the lee of the of the tent, uh, lee of the wind uh, behind the tent here, all trying to stay warm there. And there's a selfie of us uh, right when we're getting ready to get picked up. And here's our ride. Uh, so at the end of five days, we had just a blast. It was neat to see the airplane come in. It was blowing pretty darn hard. Uh, they landed in that little side slough. Oh! oh. <laughs> and that's all I have on the YK Delta, but also I wanted to recognize the special day today. Today is Paula's birthday. Let's see. And wait, 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 wait. We'll get to that in a second. I also wanted to recognize her because she's played an instrumental role in lots of you know what I like to do, but especially in photography. And she finds things that I would never would have seen. In fact, when we lived in your house, Melissa, mm -hmm. Paula was walking home uh, where all the alder kind of hangs off the cliffs. She says, Milo, Milo, this family of swallows right there. 
Uh, well, all these baby swallows were lined up on a branch. I was standing right on the Copper River Highway taking this picture just a block from my house. She was walking home from work or something when she saw it. So anyway, this is a thanks to Paula for some of the things that she's seen that I wouldn't have gotten nice photographs of uh, you know, had she not pointed them out. When we were in Ecuador in a canopy tower, we had seen this uh, howler monkey uh, in the distance but it was too far for any pictures, then finally she spotted it through a little opening in the foliage and said, Milo, Milo, you can see it right here. And here it was staring at us. So I, this is what I called my favorite picture of the year uh, in 2012. <laughs> and when we were in Australia last year, we are driving through a city park in Darwin. Uh, we had gone to Darwin because I wanted to see this really neat lizard, but I didn't think we'd see it in a groomed city park with mowed grass. But we're driving through the city park, she goes, Milo, 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 there's your lizard, there's your lizard. I go, yeah, right, yeah, right. And then she looked and it moved. She says, ah, oh, paper bag. Um, and then it stood up on its hind legs and ran to the tree. I go, holy shit. <laughs> That's it. And I got to photograph this spectacular frilled lizard, which is one of the neatest things I've ever seen in my life. And then the next day, driving over to Kakadu National Park, there was one in the middle of the highway, and I pulled over. I caught it because I didn't want to photograph it on the street and I wanted to get it to a neat something to, to put it on for photos and I had to drive, I had to get back in the car, so I handed this thing to Paula in her arms because the last thing she wanted to do was hold this thing. She wishes her arms were twice the length they were and so she's holding it like this uh, while we uh, drove it to where there's a neat stump and that, that's how I got this photograph of this one. So she's an instrumental. And in uh, Costa Rica while I was photographing something else she goes, oh look at this and found this uh, eyelash viper uh, which I also got photographs of. So anyway, it's thanks to Paula and Happy birthday. You guys want to sing happy birthday? Yeah. <laughs> oh, and in Costa Rica, she found this wrinkle-faced bat. We were on a night hike with Dana and Anita, and uh, Rhea was there in Corcovado National Park. We're all looking around with flashlights, and she shines her light up in a tree. She goes, there's something. No, it's nothing. No, no, it looks like something. And it looked like a little leaf or fruit or something hanging from a tree. And then I took a picture of it and zoomed in, and we see this wrinkle-faced bat holding a piece of fruit. Uh, eating it like corn on a cob, and uh, it was one of the neatest things we've ever seen in our lives. And anyway, that's another one of the cool things. So you guys want to sing happy birthday? Yeah. <laughs> happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, happy birthday dear Paula. Happy birthday to you. Also, Roxy's birthday. <laughs> <laughs> they both have birthdays on the same day. Anyway, thanks everybody. <laughs>